Alright, good evening. My name is Zachary Ambrose. I'm one of the organizers of NCAA Palooza. Really excited to have you here with us tonight. This is the fifth year for NCAA Palooza. Um, for those of you that uh, have been with us a while, you remember our very first one was done in partnership with the White House back in 2013. And we tackled uh, health care, education, and green in our first parade that we've been data here in North Carolina. And really pleased uh, with the progress over these last five years, and I think we'll be excited to see what we've got. So the event seeks to create positive community and economic impact by providing entrepreneurial thinkers, developers, and citizens local, state, and federal open data. And then participants use that data to build out apps or websites that anyone can use. Now open data is really about innovation, creating new innovation. It's a public resource that people can tap. And our immediate goal out of Data Palooza is to get teams to leverage data, to build something, and to take this, the process, and hopefully the grand prize, to really continue on and build something that's going to have a sizable impact. Our other goal with Data Palooza is to really build an open data ecosystem. And that's where we want people that are in government that have data to see the value in opening it up. And we want people outside of government, when they're trying to create something, trying to build something, Think of open data as a resource for when they want to create that. So we started something new last year called NC Open Pass, and that's what NC Data Palooza is part of that, CityCam, uh, originally Triangle Open Data Day, National City Data Hacking, and that's where we brought together a cluster of events around open data, civic tech, civic engagement, which is a lot of synergy, and put those together under a single banner really with the idea that you can get a single pass and you can participate in all those events for a very affordable price. And it turns out that sponsors really like that too, because they can sponsor all these events that are going on in North Carolina that have that similar theme. So I know a number of you are here as NC Open Pass holders. Um, if you didn't do that this year, we'll really encourage you to look this winter. We'll put out the Open Pass, you can sign up, and you get admission to all these events for the upcoming year in 2018. Best deal in town. <laughs> yeah, so we couldn't do this without our sponsors, um, and we've got some uh, big sponsors that really helped us out, Google Fiber, Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, uh, Raleigh Economic Development, Innovate Carolina, Red Hat, and of course HQ, where we are tonight. Now I want to say a little something special about HQ, and that they were there from the beginning. The very first organizational meeting we had for Baby Blues was at the old HQ Raleigh place over by Women's Club. And they've been just very actively engaged every step of the way here, and uh, wouldn't be would, wouldn't be what they are we wouldn't be what they are without them. But we've got a wealth of riches. Chris said I had to turn this on before it worked. I guess he was right. Data.world, Iprio, Reveal Mobile, Elastic IO, Pendo, All Things Open, Raleigh Main Event, NC State eClinic, Global Data Consortium got a tremendous number of folks who've seen value in what we're doing and what you're doing here as participants and really want to thank them. So let's all give them a hand. So a few logistics. First, the all-important Wi-Fi. So SSID, HQ Capital, only the H and the Q are capitalized, password, capital H, capital Q, the at symbol, capital C, A-P-I-T-L, so HQ at capital, exclamation point. It's also beside the elevator over there if you need to get it again on Wi-Fi. Now, we definitely want to be engaged on social media, so please uh, post about it, uh, either at NC Data Palooza or pound NC Data Palooza. Um, say what's going on with the teams, the great content you hear from speakers, we really want to drive some good traffic out there. And then, last but not least, restrooms. On either side of the elevators, there's a, a restroom on either side, so feel free to help yourself. We will be taking a break later, so if you get, think you didn't get enough food or you need a refill, we'll have time for that as we go along. Um, I did want to ask Christopher Gergen, just and put him on the spot. If, if uh, Christopher, you could just come up and uh, say a little, give us a little welcome. Thank you. So I do want to welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Christopher Gergen. I'm one of the, uh, the founding partners here at HQ Raleigh. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to HQ Raleigh before? All right, significant number. And how many of you have been to our new space? 
Here? Here. Well, other than tonight. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, just so, some context here. As Zach mentioned, uh, one of the things that's so gratifying to us is that this is really, tonight is the convergence of a long journey that we've had with David Palooza, which has been fabulous. Uh, and this really did spring from a conversation we had with Todd Park back in the day. We had uh, Todd come in. He was, at the time, the Chief Technology Officer for the White House. He came in, uh, brought a group of us together, and started talking about all the amazing things they were doing with open data, and their ideas around data palooza, and the kind of economic impact and social impact that all the GPS and weather data had had, and the way that they were trying to do this in the health and the education arena. And a group of us basically said, are you doing that on a regional basis? Are you leveraging city data? Are you leveraging state data? Are you leveraging some of the available data that's, a, that's here in these local communities? And the answer was no. Uh, and so it really presented this terrific opportunity for North Carolina to really be the first uh, in the country to step forward as a state and for our region to step forward as a region uh, to be able to say, let's do this. Uh, and let's try to pull together some really good partners uh, Jason has been there from the beginning, Jason Harris has been there from the beginning, Jason Kidd has been there from the beginning, Zach has been a uh, big part of this. So it's been, a, it's been a really fun evolution to see how it's continued to, to go. I, I had a great opportunity, I read a column for the News and Observer and the Charlotte Observer called Doing Better uh, at Doing Good, and it was fun for me to recently write about it, if anybody saw it, was out in the NNO last Sunday, to really reflect back on the journey we've had over the course of the last five years, and then go back and look at all the various finalists over the years, the kind of impact that this has had, the finalists for this year, which we're excited to learn more about. So that is that, that's one journey here. And then of course with HQ Raleigh, how we've continued to grow uh, from our original space on Hillsborough Street to our uh, space now on, on 310 South Harrington with the warehouse district, and got a couple buildings down there now. And having just opened this building about six weeks ago, for those of you who don't know, uh, we have this obviously beautiful ballroom that allows us to do these kinds of things, which is really exciting, uh, and be a true convening partner and to really open our space up and, and to try to create a really true, magnificent asset. This is an old, obviously 1930s ballroom. This used to be a men's club uh, here, uh, and it was exclusively men. And so when we took it over, we decided new chapter, new day, and we called this the Isabella Cannon Room uh, in honor of Raleigh's first female mayor. Uh, and we're really looking at this idea of trying to promote women innovation and some of the amazing things that are going on. But we also have floors eight through 11 here too. So if you've got an opportunity, you can explore around and see some of the, some of the, see some of the suites that we've opened up. And now we're about 90% full, which is really exciting in about six weeks or four weeks of opening. And then we're about to open up uh, the Centerline building uh, in partnership with Centerline and Digital Marketing in Glenwood, which is another 31,000 square feet. So it's a really, it's an exciting time, it's an exciting process and it's through some of our growth here. And we really do believe that open data uh, and, and some of the amazing stuff that's going on in Alaire Stefan's here too with, uh, with NC Riot, that's a big partner of ours. This world of really thinking about open data and the kind of impact we can have is, I think, very consistent with this community. Obviously, some of the amazing things that are going on with All Things Open and with Red Hat. Uh, it's just, it's just, this is a vibrant and dynamic community, and so this is a, a nice opportunity to bring it all together. And we're excited to be able to host it. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> circle for this year's NC Open Pass. We kicked off City Camp here with the Lightning Talks uh, September 28th, seems like just yesterday, but uh, bringing it full circle for the year. We're really happy to have Mayor Pro Tem Steve Rao from Morrisville with us. And here's Steve. Hey Steve, thanks for being with us. Steve's a great leader in, in innovation. Uh, he's doing some wonderful things in Morrisville and around the state. So this is our fifth year, and I want to just tell you a little bit about the previous four winners just to give you a sense of what folks have done. So our first winner in 2013 was the Parking Initiative. And they actually partnered with North Hills, they implemented their parking app, and they released a similar app for downtown Raleigh. And these were some folks who were really just big Raleigh boosters and really saw that as a barrier, and they dug in. Uh, 2014, that's where we had Stone Soup connecting folk, food donors uh, with the nearby food pantries and those who need food. It was recognized by Code for America as a priority project. Two years ago, 
Open 511 uh, was a clearinghouse for bridge building information. And they used Raleigh as a prototype where they did ways integration with Raleigh's 511, Open 511 data. What that resulted in, though, was code development so that you got integration with Waze and Open 511 so you had interoperability on a broader scale. And last year, Kids Transit, our youngest winner, for those of you who were there, a uh, young man, he was 11 when he pitched. Um, yeah, really felt bad for the other teams having to pitch against him. <laughs> really well. Uh, but it enabled students and parents to identify safe routes to school, to crowdsource uh, uh, walking, biking routes, reduce bus transit, improve health, and really help build community in neighborhoods. So we started this year's competition at City Camp with a hackathon on that Saturday. And that was a sprint hackathon. Teams formed there, they worked, we had judges. Uh, they pitched to the judges, there was a $1,000 prize, and that was really meant to prime the pump for the competition leading into the finale. Coming out of city camp, we put out a call for teams. So it was open competition, anybody was eligible as long as their project used open data. Those teams got the chance to pitch at All Things Open on October 23rd, and we went down the field there to the three finalists you're going to hear from tonight. The finalists that the winning pitch tonight is going to take them a $5,000 grand prize, they'll award it at the event of end of tonight's event. So before we jump in um, to the program, just two quick things. We talked about sponsors and how important they are to what we do, and they're critical, but th this event is put on by a great team of volunteer organizers, and it wouldn't happen without them. If you're a volunteer organizer, stand up, point your hand just so folks can see, and let's give, give them all a little bit. Just grab one of the organizers you, see, you saw that stood up. Um, tell them you want to be a part of it as we begin to put next year's events together. We'd love to have you be part of our team. Uh, with that, what we're going to do today is we're going to have two uh, quick speakers. Uh, we're going to do 10 minute presentations. We're going to go through the judging process. We'll have the three teams pitch. After they pitch, we're going to take a quick break so that you can get uh, more food, refill your glasses. The judges are going to go down and deliberate. We've got a great keynote on blockchain and how it's getting applied in cities. Um, judges are going to come back up, we'll announce the winner, present the prize, and then um, we'll just end the great big day. So, uh, with that, I didn't ask Christopher Rubin to come back up, but uh, just give us a chance. Okay, this is Nicole. Flip it around. I'm going to flip it around. Yeah. Are you okay with that, Nicole? <laughs> so, Nicole's CIO of the town of Cary, before that, which was with Raleigh, um, has been a great leader uh, of open data. Both the uh, open data program in Raleigh started under her leadership, and then uh, now town of Cary, they're doing some great things. Uh, she recently awarded the North Carolina Technology Association's Public Sector CIO of the Year. Passionate technology leader, we're really lucky to have you with us tonight, Nicole. Thanks. Um, 
So when I, I was thinking about you know coming here today and sharing with you guys really what it means to be a connected community, I want to talk about what I think it means for for Perry and others. And so I started to think about those smart cities and sensors, putting sensors everywhere. And, and I do think that is part of being a smart community, right? It's all the sensors and being able to know where parking is. We heard um, Zach talk about parking apps before, which we all use. And we use data, we send it to Waze. But I actually think it's really about how we as a municipality interact right, with our citizens and how we do that. So every day we use these devices, which by the way, just in case you didn't know, they are actually phones. <laughs> um, and how we interact with our friends, how we interact with our, our doctors, our hairdressers, we get appointment reminders, how we interact online with Amazon, we get search results, we get recommendations. Well, why should government be any different, right? I mean, you, you live in this community, we should know how to personalize services for you. And so I think that's where we're going. I mean, the catalyst is there with all the technology, it's just figuring out how to put it all together. So at the town, what we've done is we've moved to more of a platform strategy. And by doing that, that's gonna put all the data in one place, right? So at the end of the day, our hope is that we have this 360 degree view of our citizens and we can see all the interactions that you have and we can personalize those services with you, right? So some examples that we talk about are, um, for example, if you were to go to Bond Park or Ray Park and you notice that there was an issue with the restroom, well, why can't you just text 311 and get a live person on the phone, right? I mean, interaction, right? Communication. Same way you probably all interact with your friends and kids, so it's that two-way interaction. We can do it. We have the technology. We're getting close. Um, so keep your eye out. You'll see that. <clears throat> we also um, built a skill on Alexa. I use my Alexa every morning, that's for the traffic, most of the weather, so I know what to wear. But if perhaps, it doesn't ever happen, but just in case you're in Cary and we missed your trash, you should be able to say, Alexa, tell Town of Cary they've missed my trash, which on the back end, we'll open up a case and we'll send someone out to pick up your trash. So that is actually being beta tested today. We'd also like to be able to um, not have you sit around like you probably do for a cable company if they were to install something <laughs> for hours or days, is say, hey, I just built a new deck. When is my inspector coming, right? It would be awesome to get a message saying inspector's on the way, there's the appointment time. We can do it. So we're just going to put all these pieces together. The, all the touch points that you work today in your daily lives, the way you work with technology, we can do the same. We just have to get there. Um, you know, we have conversations all the time about how we do, whether it's a two-way text messaging, whether it's using a chat bot, whether it's um, going to the Parks and Rec site and saying, I'm not really sure what class I want. Well, let me make some suggestions, just the way Amazon did. Let me also tell you, by the way, your kid has signed up for baseball the last three seasons. Hey, there's this great event over at USA Baseball, you should check it out, right? So let's start to make all that personalized, much like we have in our daily lives. So for us, we're, we're embarking on this journey. We've moved towards a platform. We've purchased some other tools that um, will leverage the platform that will um, get smarter, right? It'll have intelligence built into it, which will help us as we get better and better at understanding what Ian would like from the town of Gary. I know I'm a little afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I think that service is probably really personalized. Um, so, you know, I think if we can get there, we can have these open communication channels, we're really building a stronger community, right? We're really building a better place. We're enhancing lives. We're creating economic development. I believe, you know, not that we have a lot of crime, but all that's going to go down because you have this sense of pride in the community that you live in, you work in, you play in, and you're able to have those conversations with them and have that service go that one step above, especially if it's personalized. If you were to call in a message and we could 
We knew all the other interactions that you had that are hopefully positive. Um, by harnessing all of that data, it's going to make us have a much richer community. We'll also have all of that data, hopefully, to share with you that you guys can do amazing things with. So I am um, looking forward to seeing what you all have come up with. But I just wanted to take a few minutes to share what I think is the next step in the connected community. Anyone have any questions? Come on. <laughs> Will you share what you're doing with Apex and Green Level and what to add, can you incorporate? Can you incorporate uh, some of the surrounding communities um, and take take what you're doing as a beta sure. project? What kind of buy-in would you need to get from from those communities? Then? Yeah. So I mean, here's the thing. And if anyone's met me before, they they hear me talk about regionalism all the time, right? Because for us, it's great that we can do these things and carry, but we're much stronger as a region if we can build things together. So, for example, we're, we've turned our campus, we've got a campus, um, into a smart campus, right? Because we have everything in our little area that represents the town on a larger scale, right? We've got parking, we've got trash, recycling facilities, lights. And so we're able to test all of that out there. And our goal is to let us test it, right? We're doing it really at no cost because the partners like Cisco and uh, Trillion and others are, are piloting it, so they're giving us the technology and, of course, in hopes that we will then deploy vastly throughout the town, right? But let us do that work for you because we have the means to do it, we've got the talent to do it, and then share it out. Yes, sir? Hi, I'm wondering, um, you kind of made an assumption that the back end is right, so how do you see, mm -hmm. you said you ran over the ticket, which to me says that's the whole process. How do you see some changing, influencing the change on the back end? On what we can see in the back end? Yeah, so I'd be lying if I didn't say we had about 100 Discord systems today. <laughs> but the idea is to build all that data in, right? So we're in it, we've got obviously utility data, all of that, and changes and uh, builds it, builds up all the information. In terms of the flow in the back end, if that's what you're getting to, yeah. Um, efficiencies, 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 right? The more data we have, the more efficient we can become, the easier it is to identify where we have little hiccups along the way, and for us to streamline it. You know, we look at it today, and Terry's here, he's from Terry, Terry from Terry. Um, and you, if you can talk to Terry, Terry says we've got like 10 work order systems, right? Because everyone thought their work order system was special for them, right? And now we've got it, now the goal we put it all in one system so we can streamline all those processes. accuses me of swallowing a microphone, so I will uh, use that to my advantage here. So I thought just um, to just riff off of a couple things that N Nicole has just talked about and throw a couple things out for consideration and for us to talk about is that um, how do we think about this within the context of an ecosystem? So if we're really thinking about what outcomes we're striving for, right? The outcomes we're striving for is that we want to create a better, better communities, better cities, more empowered citizens, 
better results and outcomes for the people who live in our communities, um, and, and ultimately a better quality of life uh, overall, right? So if those are the outcomes that we're generally striving for, how do we actually get there? Uh, so HQ is just one piece of the pie, data flus is another piece of the pie. I think we have to think more holistically about what makes up a better ecosystem and a better innovation ecosystem, uh, especially in a regional context. And then I would throw one more important word on there, which is how do we create a better inclusive innovation ecosystem, right? And by that I mean, how do we make sure that as we are building a better society, as we're building a better region, that we're doing it in a way that truly engages all parts of our community, especially disenfranchised communities, and especially disenfranchised communities of color. Um, because as we have these kinds of conversations, they tend to get fairly isolated very quickly into a small set of conversations, and I think we can't really create a truly better society without making a truly equitable and inclusive society. So what does that ecosystem look like and how can we collectively work to be able to get there? So let's, let's define first of all what we mean by ecosystem. So on ecosystem, we think that there are basically five levers to what makes up a really good ecosystem. The first is you've got to create the talent pipeline. So you gotta figure out a way that we can home grow, recruit and retain really high quality talent that is capable of being the kind of entrepreneurial problem solvers we want them to be, right? So just back that out for a second. So it's thinking about how our K-12 systems can really develop next generation problem solvers who can use data in a meaningful way, who look at problems and can start to think about ways to solve them in highly innovative entrepreneurial uh, ways that can figure out a way to take ideas and put them into action. That's what these competitions are all about, right? It's why I love the fact that last year's Data Palooza winner was 11, now 12. Now, granted, he was going, you know, his wingman, I think, was his dad. Uh, so, but still, the fact that he was engaged in that effort. Now, that was a pretty special kid. I mean, let's recognize the fact that there were some really good ideas that came out of that. But we have to make sure that that doesn't happen just a really rarefied air of a curious kid who goes off and gets a lot of homeschooling support to be able to go do that work. That actually our infrastructure and our schools are fundamentally designed to be able to foster this next generation of entrepreneurial problem solving in places like Southeast Raleigh and Northeast Raleigh and Northeast Central Durham, right? And then we think about sort of our broader ecosystem, how do we make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible? That's true also of our community colleges, right? Uh, Durham Tech and Wake Tech are absolutely amazing. We have a fantastic partnership with Wake Tech and what we're doing here. And how do we help to harness that kind of energy that's coming out? And of course, our university systems. We've got four top-notch universities uh, in this area, right? Between NC State and UNC and Duke and NC Central. So how do we continue to build that talent pipeline and continue to recruit and retain that talent in our community? Second is how do you create the enabling environment to be able to connect those entrepreneurial problem solvers with the resources and relationships they need to be as successful as possible. Like, that's one of the challenges that we had about 10 years ago here in the Triangle. Is that if you were an entrepreneurial problem solver and you were coming up through our K-12 system, our universities, our community colleges, or you just had a good idea, you had no community. You had no way to be able to plug into like-minded people in a meaningful way. You had to go seek them out proactively as opposed to feeling like there was a welcoming, supportive, inclusive community bringing you in. And that's really what HQ sprung out of, uh, was to create this kind of community that could connect these emerging problem solvers. And it's connecting problem solvers with mentors and coaches and technical assistants, access to capital, access to amazing spaces, kindred spirits, feeling like you're part of the tribe, all of that. That's the enabling layer. And we're getting better and better at that. One of the sponsors here is Innovate Raleigh. The reason why HQ was born is because Raleigh basically decided that they were falling behind on the entrepreneurial train and they needed to be much more intentional and they didn't have this kind of community and so HQ was born out of that. One of my favorite uh, sayings, I frequently talk to uh, folks in Raleigh about this. So I, I live in Durham uh, and, uh, and when I moved to Durham and the reason I, uh, I got deep ties there and I, I teach social innovation and entrepreneurship at Duke, but when I first moved back to D 
to Durham, uh, we were starting to turn the corner and trying to make it a little bit more of a cool space. And it, there was a saying at one point that Durham had stolen the cool from Chapel Hill, the funk from Carborough, and left the, the boring in Raleigh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, that, that was true. That's been true for a number of years. But it was so interesting when we first announced that we were launching HQ, 500 people reached out to us in two weeks. Uh, and this was about six years ago. And when we opened, we opened full. And when we opened the next space, we opened full. And like I said, it's, it's continued. So it's about creating this kind of intentional enabling environment. So that's the second aspect. The third aspect is how do you actually create really good sources of data and analytics to be able to tell what is actually happening in this world? Because if you don't get the data, you can't get the feedback loops that build on that. Now, that's Nicole's mentioned some of the great things that uh, you know City of Cary is doing, what the City of Raleigh is doing, etc. We still have a dearth of data. We've got, a, and this is by the way, just data writ large. It's mostly economic development data, and especially if you look at it through the lens of inclusion, we just don't know a lot of stuff. Uh, we know some basic stuff, right? So that if you look at the overall population of the triangle, it's about 35 percent or so. Uh, 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 African American, more or less, right? Uh, and yet, less than two percent of business receipts are generated by African American-owned businesses. Like, but you you get deeper into the data, you don't actually know what that means, what that represents. We got to get better about that kind of stuff to really determine how well are we doing around creating a truly inclusive innovation ecosystem in our work, and then making that data publicly available so that we can do things like this. The fourth aspect is to be able to figure out how do we create better policy. Better municipal policy, economic debate, uh, development policy, community development policy, how we use our data, how we release our data, how do we make sure that our systems are talking with one another. Because without good policy, it has to be ultimately a public-private relationship. So we've got to figure out a way that within the context of this ecosystem that we're creating this kind of alignment that we're talking about. And then the fifth piece of this is how are we sharing these stories out. There are so many amazing stories that are emerging from our community. I've got a colleague and friend of mine who's at the, uh, the, the New York Times, David, David Bornstein, he's got this great saying that says, problems scream while solutions whisper. Mm -hmm. right? And I think part of our challenge is to be able to amplify those solutions. Lift them up and say, here's some of the amazing stuff that's going on. Right? So in all of the crazy noise that's coming out of Washington, and I can say that because having moved from Washington 10 years ago, right, I'm so glad I'm here, which is crazy because if you think about the kind of politics we have here, uh, that's a <laughs> whole different story. But, but the reality is, is that even in all of that noise, there's some amazing citizen-led work that's happening around problem solving that's leading to a better society. We gotta lift that up. And if we lift that up, then more people wanna be part of it and it creates that flywheel effect that we're talking about. And then if we think about it, again, always within the lens of diversity and inclusion, figuring out a way that we can create that talent pipeline that is truly inclusive creating that enabling layer that brings people in and connects everybody to the resources and relationships that, so that we've got more entrepreneurial ventures created by more people coming from all sorts of different backgrounds, that we have better data, that we have better policy, and that we have better storytelling. And so part of the thing I think we need to be thinking about as we celebrate these amazing things and hear from the finalists that are coming up with some really cool ideas around some of the open data available to us is that let's not make this an isolated effort. Let's try to think about ways we can connect dots in a meaningful way. Bring our K-12 system. So happy to see David here, a friend of mine who's been engaged with K-12 education reform for a long time. Right? How do we bring the schools in? How do we bring the universities in? How do we bring uh, the entrepreneurs in an enabling environment? How do we think about data? How do we think about policy? How do we think about storytelling? So I'll leave that uh, uh, with you all to think about. I'm happy to take a couple of questions if those of you who are interested. By the way, I, I'm sorry I did, I'm not rocking the clip on time. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a good look. Oh, uh, you talked about inclusion. So uh, are there plans underway for uh, Shaw and, and St. Augs and, and East Meredith, uh, St. Mary, they you know try try to get either minority or women uh, in, into through a STEM program and the like to, to start participating in in your grand scheme. Yeah, so I'm so glad you you asked that. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah, yeah good. That's one of the things we have we have. 
crappy acoustics in here when it gets really loud, but when somebody needs to project, it really carries. Uh, so um, yes is the, the answer to this. So Shaw uh, has partnered up with the Carolina Small Business Development Fund to be able to create something called the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center that we're partnered up with. Uh, that's on South Blunt Street. Uh, St. Augs is also getting involved in that kind of effort. And there's a broader sort of HBCU effort in general. Uh, we're excited because we've actually just brought on a new, at HQ, we brought on a new social entrepreneur in residence named Reggie McCrimmon. Reggie graduated from NC Central in 2013, two times student body president. So, and then he went out to go work with GK Butterfield and then Congressional Black Caucus. And he's got a social enterprise to actually help to develop co-working spaces on HBCU campuses and then plug them into the broader entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we're giving him a platform and a home to be able to do that and help driving some of our diversity and inclusion efforts. So there are some really good things that are going on, similarly with NC Central and some of the work that they're doing. And by the way, just as a, a quick plug on this, I did a column and got a chance to really look at the data. If you were to look at economic mobility and the universities and colleges across North Carolina that are doing the most to be able to help students move in terms of economic strata from lower quintiles to upper quintiles, uh, the HBCUs are at the top of that list. Like the top five or six universities moving that needle are all HBCUs. So they're doing an amazing job and we're gonna figure out a way to continue to support them in a meaningful way. Um, that's also true of some of our K-12 systems and sort of the general district level, but it's not getting deep enough into this work and we wanna be more of a partner on that. We've got a great partnership with St. Mary's, uh, but we wanna do more with the Wake County Public Schools and think about ways to be able to really think and strengthen that that town pipeline. And I think it's gonna come down to some of our collective efforts to say, how can you contribute? How do you get involved? How do you mentor? How do you teach classes? Because if you really look at our, our, our uh, teacher prep uh, uh, work that we do, and, and, and they just, they're not exposed to these ideas in any meaningful way. Uh, and this is not a crack on teachers and the backgrounds that they've got, they just haven't been exposed. And so I think the challenge that we, what we've got to do is span boundaries and connect those dots in a meaningful way. Get, that's one of the things I'm excited about with the St. Mary's partnership is that they're, all their teacher professional development happens at HQ now. Uh, and so now it's an exciting opportunity to be able to do that. Happy to talk more for those offline if anybody's interested. I know that we want to get the program underway, but any remaining questions? Anna? All right, Anna, bring it on. As a, as, a, as a young, dynamic millennial that is uh, changing the world, let's hear, you, let's hear from you. Yeah, and just to do like, you know, let's do a quick pulse check here where we get like, you know, 5% of the women, 5% of the audience here are women, uh, right? So, or 10, but we, so I think it's really coming upon us. I've got a 12 year old daughter uh, and it's, I think all about exposure and empowerment and just giving a shot at what's going on. I don't know if anybody, did anybody see uh, New York Times two days ago, there was a fabulous uh, piece for Veterans Day talking about the power of inclusion. Did anybody read this? So it was all about the story of, uh, because in World War II, right, most of the men were off fighting the war, and so they had to recruit women to come in on, on multiple dimensions, and it turns out that some of the top code breakers coming out of World War II were women. And it was like this amazing cadre of women who were these incredible code breakers, and it was the first time I'd have really heard that story before. Uh, and it was an example of how we need to do more of this, uh, recognizing the fact that we are all stronger, like I, if we include everybody in this equation, and it has to start with our education systems. Uh, it has to start early on. Uh, Carol Dweck, who's a great psychologist out of Stanford, talks about this growth mindset. It's instilling the growth mindset throughout the STEAM disciplines and trying to get that, get that process underway uh, at an early age. Uh, and, and really giving, cultivating both the mindset and importantly the skill sets to be able to participate actively uh, in, these kinds of, in these kinds of endeavors. Because this is not uncomplicated work, right? Uh, to be able to really disrupt the status quo is not 
it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, you got to come in with some interesting ideas, but if you can come in with some interesting ideas and really put some you know, gray matter to work and figure it out in a meaningful way and get the right kind of uh, coaching and mentorship, that's where, you know, if you really think about this, I believe that the complexity of the challenges that are facing our society right now are still outpacing the innovative solutions to be able to address them. And the only way we're going to close that gap is by developing these kinds of innovation ecosystems and trying to make them as open and inclusive as possible, engaging all women in a big way, uh, and again, uh, communities who are traditionally disenfranchised and getting them into the mix. So um, we're trying to do a lot of this uh, at HQ. We can't do this on our own. Uh, we'd love to have you engaged uh, as much as you possibly can be. Uh, and again, we're, we're thrilled to host you here, uh, here at HQ, and look forward to the show. <laughs>